Welcome, everyone. Everyone hear me? Okay. I want to welcome everyone to the Richard B. Russell Special Collections Libraries, and thank you so much for attending this year's Food Power and Policy Lecture. We're so excited you can make it here this evening. I'm Kaylin Washnox Dukesbury. I'm an outreach archivist here at the library, and it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished guests today, Nick Heinen and Maurice Bailey. It's over in the wings. Um, <laughs> But before we begin, I want to first thank the Wilson Center for Humanity and Arts, and I also would like to thank the Richard B. Russell Foundation, whose generous support makes wonderful events like this possible here today. I'd like to first introduce Nick Heinen, who is a distinguished research professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Georgia, a visiting scholar in food studies program at Spelman College, and the co-director of the UGA Cornelia Walker Bailey Program on Land and Agriculture, with Mr. Maurice Bailey. And so please let's welcome Dr. Nick Heinen up here and I'm gonna have him introduce our keynote guest. Good afternoon, everybody. All right, I was hoping it'd be a, a warm welcome to our guests who drove all the way from the coast, felt uh, felt happy and, and, and glad to be here. Uh, I've I've uh, I've been asked to to do an introduction, and I had to take the opportunity to tell a few stories as uh, as we do. Um, the first story, I guess, starts back in in 2014 when I was first invited to go to Sapelo Island uh, by Dr. Merrill Alber, who had recently been appointed uh, as the director of UGA's Marine Institute. Um, Merrill had had come to recognize uh, over over the long term of doing research there that the relationships on island between the UGA community and the Saltwater Geechee community uh, had not been great, to to say the least. There have been good times. There have been bad times. Uh, keeping in mind that UGA's Marine Institute was situated and sited and founded in 1953, so it's quite a, a long presence of of interactions. And she asked if I could come to Ireland and figure out a way to help build bridges, uh, given my interest in community-based social science. Uh, and I said, sure. I said, yes, please. I said, thank you very much. Uh, and so I started to uh, explore and meet people and very slowly build connection. And uh, I reached out to a descendant at Merrill's suggestion named Jazz Watts. Uh, and Jazz... I asked Jazz if he would speak with me as a as a as a kind of a gatekeeper to the community, and and Jazz said he would. He was very polite about it. He said he would, but only if I got uh, permission from a particular elder in the community uh, would he speak with me. And uh, I didn't realize the the journey that this uh, this particular proposition will begin for me. It took me about a year uh, to to get her convinced to speak with me. Uh, a lot of phone calls, a lot of knocking on the door, a lot of uh, just showing up unannounced, as I do sometimes, uh, which maybe didn't work best in my interests. Um, and, and one day uh, she said, come on in, have a seat at my kitchen table. And uh, she would end up becoming one of the most important people in my life. Her name was Miss Cornelia Walker Bailey, Maurice's mother. <clears throat> um, after lots of discussion of me sitting down and saying, how can we do better? What can we do? Uh, not going into the conversations with any uh, assumptions or uh, expectations. Uh, one day telling her that I had done some work in South Africa around urban agriculture, she asked if I would help her and some other people revitalize a series of heritage crops on island um, that she thought were very necessary for economic development. It was here at this moment when I started to understand what the notion of cultural genocide means because Ms. Cornelia started to explain to me how over the long history of this island, people had been dispossessing Saltwater Geechee people of their land, of their communities. And it was something that was, you know, like I knew it in a book sense, but I didn't know it in, a, in an everyday life, uh, lived experience way. And it, it had a real profound impact on me. And this was about the same time that Maurice was moving back to Saplo after having moved away and uh, doing other things and working on, on in all kinds of ways. And uh, it's, it's important to say, and some of you in this room know this story, but he made an immediate impact on me. Uh, the, one of the very first times I met him 
quite literally, uh, when he walked up to me in a, in a bar called The Trough and he offered me a plate of fried alligator and said, here. And I said, I said, thank you. Because uh, that seemed like the thing to do as someone uh, trained in ethnographic work. Uh, I didn't want to be rude. And I didn't mention to him that I had been a vegetarian for 20 years uh, to that point. And I ate the alligator. Uh, and I won't go into too many details, but I was sick for two weeks. Uh, my wife, Jennifer, here can uh, remember it well, unfortunately. Uh, and it got so bad that I, I thought to myself, well, if I'm going to be committed to coming to this place, I'm just going to have to give up vegetarianism, which I did. Uh, so I never felt that bad again. So then we started working together. We started planting things and growing things and uh, never in my life would I have thought that I would become a farmer and I don't consider myself a farmer, but I consider myself as someone very interested in helping him become a farmer. And, uh, and we made some good progress on things under the vision and guidance of his mother. And then in 2017, September 15th, Hurricane Irma flooded the island, flooded the community. And there were six feet of storm surge in Hog Hammock. Uh, and it was devastating and it did a lot of damage. And uh, the, the, the sugar cane that we had planted was was sitting under six feet of salt water and everything kind of felt kind of dismal and, and, and like maybe had been lost. And we were talking about it and his brother, Stanley Walker, suggested that we should just flush it with fresh water and, and everything would be OK. So we did that. And while that was happening. Uh, I was sitting with with Miss Cornelia in the kitchen and we were having conversations about what to do and, and how to proceed. And uh, and and she she was pretty, pretty broke up uh, about the storm and the damage. And I promised her uh, in that particular meeting uh, that I would do everything I could to help Maurice uh, see her vision through. People often ask me why I spend so much time working with Maurice and, and doing the work that we do. And I think that it, uh, it it comes down to that promise in many ways because she passed away unexpectedly two weeks later. And so that was the last time I ever had the opportunity to talk to her. After that happened, we collected ourselves. Uh, I collected my, I tried to collect myself and Maurice did what Maurice does. And we decided to form something called the UGA Cornelia Walker Bailey Program on Land and Agriculture as a way to really uh, try to institutionalize her legacy and try to build resources and try and do the work that she was interested in. There are a lot of stories that I could muster to think about how cultural genocide uh, plays out. And it, I think that Maurice will go into much, much greater detail today. But after Miss Cornelia passed, I, I came back the next week and we were still doing cleanup from, from Irma. And I remember being invited by Maurice to, to come to the Behavior Cemetery, which is a very important hollow ground, sacred space. And we were gonna prepare the grounds uh, for, her, for her funeral, uh, which was going to happen uh, soon after. And I remember picking up limbs and branches and I remember out of the side of my eye seeing his brother Stanley digging the grave where Miss Cornelia was going to be rested. And he's dug many graves in behavior. And Stanley is uh, known to tell him lots of stories. Uh, but he told, he told one a, a fair bit, which is that when people are put laid to rest in behavior, they are, are buried with their feet facing the east. So when Gabriel blows his horn, uh, people can pop up and, and go to Mecca as, as is in line with the Islamic tradition. And the reason that is the case is that it's very important to note that Maurice's fifth great grandfather, a man named Bilali Muhammad, uh, brought the first Islamic text to the Americas. And so this community has the first Muslim community in the Americas. This is like the layering of history and importance of this space that we're talking about and why notions of cultural genocide become so very important. And the reason that I bring that up, that particular story, as, as sad as it might, might sound, I think it makes a point that... There has been such an organized effort by wealthy, uh, connected, mostly white people uh, in the community to systematically uh, dispossess Geechis of their land so they can have their second homes and, and do the various things that they want to do. And there's, there's one in particular very recently who has started to talk about wanting to be buried in behavior center. And if you just close your eyes and think about the insanity of wanting to be buried in this sacred space and feeling so emboldened uh, and, and so uh, unaware 
of the weight of this history, I think that it really speaks to what uh, the descendant community on island is struggling, struggling about. And so I guess I want to say that I don't know anyone that works harder than Maurice Bailey. I haven't learned anything more from anyone but Maurice Bailey. And I am constantly in awe and inspired by how much he does for his community and for other people in his life. So uh, I think uh, with all that by way of an introduction, it is one of the great honors of my uh, career and life to introduce my, my dear friend and colleague, Mr. Maurice Bailey. And that sounds like a eulogy, Nick. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, that was dead already, but I'm still here. <laughs> well, this probably won't go the way that this was advertised. <laughs> um, so I'm glad y'all didn't pay money to come in here because <laughs> we're going to talk very little about food today. So. Uh, there is a lot going on in our community. Uh, Nick said a lot about we losing communities, uh, said a lot about entitlement of older white gentlemen in the deep south of southeast Georgia. Um, we are under attack right now. So we are the last kind of intact each community in our area. We are the most endangered community in our area because of land loss, because of people loss. So we may not exist in a few years as Geechee descendants of Sapo if we don't get help from people like you all because we so few in numbers. There's only 29 descendants left on this island. At one point, there been around 800 people on Sapo. So we're in trouble right now. So. We're gonna talk more about politics today. We're gonna to talk more about ingest of people today. We're gonna to talk about how, as black people, we have a small window of freedom. We never had that total freedom. We went from slavery to Jim Crow, to fighting the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, to the Civil Rights Movement. Um, we never had that total freedom and, and never, embrace when someone white come up to me and say, well, we're going to help y'all fight for y'all rights. Why should you? We should have had those rights all along. Uh, so to this day, we still got these people in these positions that are still dispossessing us from our land and from our culture. And having a small number of African Americans in this country, we don't have the numbers to make those changes. Um, so we need people that want to do the moral thing, have the conscience, and not following uh, the political party or not following the race because you have to because of your race or political parties. Uh, we need people that's going to do the right thing. Uh, so that's where we're going to be at today. This is totally off script. So we got, what, 58 slides? <laughs> we got that many? No. Oh. Well, we ain't going to talk about a lot of those. Uh. <laughs> so, we're going to skip that. That's when I was a little. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you can find Sapolo on there. This thing got a pointer, too, right there. So, this is Sapolo. We're the fourth largest burial island along the Georgia coast. So, this island is mostly owned by the state of Georgia. So, 16,500 acres. And in our community consists of 434 acres. Within that 434 acres, the state of Georgia owns 178 acres at 434 acres. Uh, then we have some questionable land in there. Then we had none of the sense owning land in there. So we don't have a lot of land left as African-American people uh, on Sapelo. So just in case you wonder where Sapelo at, because people don't hear about Sapelo, say, what's the Sapelo? Where's the Sapelo? So that's, that's where we're at. We nestled right in, in there, kind of forgotten in there. So if you hear anything about Sapple, you either hear state of Georgia, University of Georgia, but you don't hear about the people of Sapple. And we call ourselves, we are the people of Sapple. Oh. 
Well, this just some images of, of Sapplo. This is one of the former owners of Sapplo House, R.J. Reynolds, that bought the island in 1912, went into 1964. Um, and basically, just some more pictures of the island. But Reynolds was pretty much responsible for a lot of land loss on Sapplo. Um, we was being consolidated from 1912 um, to actually the 1960s. We lost a lot of communities uh, because of the, the rich people that came to the island. Richard Reynolds was one of them. So that's not one of my favorite pictures and I should have deleted out the slide. But. Uh, and Nick talked a little bit about Balali, but we're gonna Acting funny. <laughs> uh, we kind of proud. We proud of where we came from. We proud to say that we're salt water Geechee people. We proud to say we, we can trace ourselves back thirteen generations. We proud of the fact that you know there was original forty four families on Sapple. We got seven families left on Sapple now. But a lot of this linked to this guy Bilali. So he was a slave driver for Thomas Spalding. He had a lot of kids too. So yeah, I think seven daughters and twelve sons. So. It really helped populate the island. Uh, so that's pretty much where Bilali was, was from. Um, like I said, we're going to skip to a, a lot of that. Um, this is the document that Nick was speaking about. That's here at the University of Georgia. So I did have opportunity to put my hands on it for the first time. Uh, it was very powerful just to put my hands on that, um, just to, to feel that connection from, from my people from that far back. You gave me a broken clicker. You put fresh batteries in this thing and still in your huh? Yes, I'm working. <laughs> I'm just sitting there just pushing and pushing. <laughs> All right, let's see. How about that? We're going the wrong way. Okay, this is Miss Kanee Walker Bailey that wrote. The book that Nick was speaking about also, um, this also shows some of our communities that was on South. This is Behavior Cemetery that Nick was speaking about. Uh, and we just have entitlement of people that just want to be buried in our cemetery uh, just because they feel that they should have the right to do so. And we are totally against that, of course. Because we believe our ancestor spirits are still among us. We this been an old slave community, so people have been tortured for a long time. I say tortured on Sapo, and so we have people buried in that cemetery from the time the cemetery was started doing slavery to present. So why would we put a racist, entitled person in the cemetery among our ancestors? So we got to fight to keep the even out of cemetery. So, and this just point out some of the places, the community that we used to own on South Low, we used to own a lot of communities. Um, and throughout my mother's life and Ella's life, oh, it's working now? Um, they literally watch their communities disappear. They watch all their communities, they being forced out of the community. Uh, land was stolen from people. People's name was forged on deeds. X was put on deeds. And people lost a lot of land, some other intimidation. So they witnessed a lot of this. So to have the last community of Hawhead community in trouble and have the last community still being threatened by developers, threatened by state officials, threatened by local government, uh, it's heartbreaking to sit there and watch your last community disappear from only 1,200 acres approximately down to a little over 200 acres, 202 acres uh, on Sapple. Uh, you gonna get this right in a minute. Well, this is just some of our communities, again, once again, that was on, on Sapelo, um, and say so this is our last community here. Um, and it just shows you, we actually have more homes than this. 
the upper land on Sapo consists of about 10,000 acres of upper land. The rest is, is Tyler Creek uh, and marshland. And as I mentioned, most of it's owned by the state of Georgia. So our community sits on one of the lowest parts of Sapo. So when we've consolidated into Harlem community, we was moving to the one of the lowest part of South Florida. So we're experiencing flooding on a constant basis on South Florida. It is not unusual to have salt water coming through your yard five or six times a year. So that is another thing that we're in danger of flooding. So it's a, it's a lot going on in our little community of Hawk Hammond. And this kind of gives you a breakdown of the land throughout the years, the population throughout the years, pretty much. Um, the biggest population loss was between the 1970s and 1980s. And that because of the taxes that increases on, on South of 300% at one time. So people started losing land. People got afraid. Uh, people sold land. They're trying to get out because the taxes went up 300%. So that's our biggest loss of people during that time. Uh, and since then, the population just keeps dropping uh, because it wasn't any jobs available either. And people were discouraged. They always said, we can't win, leave Bucker alone. And Bucker just turned for a white man. So people got discouraged because they've been fighting their whole life and they, they continue to fight to stay at home. So right now, we down to 29 people right now. Uh, and as people pass away, people lose more interest. Uh, and as people pass away, we got non-descendants approaching people to purchase that land. And once that elder has passed away, then they approach the younger generation to purchase the land on Sapo. Yes, you're a little too early for questions, but yeah. Yeah, you, know, you raise your hand like you're in school, I'll let you go this time, but you know. Uh, it is. So out of that 16,500 acres, Hall Hammock is the only place that land is property owned that you can purchase land. Yes. Any other question? Okay. All right. Uh, this is an example of just, just the community. So this is not Sapo, this is just the community. So I'm going to start this one off. Um, the Hatch Authority owns th this land. Uh, the Hatch Authority is owned by the state of Georgia. Uh, this land used to be owned by the former owner, Richard Reynolds, that was responsible for my Geechee coming out now moving on to one community. So this land was sold to the state of Georgia within our community. Uh, so we're trying to acquire this land, but we're having trouble acquiring this land. Some of our land as descendants came from this these plots of land and the Heritage Act is supposed to be in place to protect our community and protect the land. But for the last 30, 40 years, no commissioner, no governor will allocate any funds to the Harris Authority Act uh, to preserve the land. So if we had to sell our land, it's supposed to go back to the Harris Authority. They supposed to keep it safe, uh, but they, in purpose, do not put money into that fund so they know they can sell it to their friends and family. So we lost a lot of land because the state of Georgia refused to support us as they, they wrote this document and say they will, uh, but they have not supported us with this land loss uh, on Sapo. So they are partly responsible for the way we at now because they refuse to put money into this fund, the Heritage Act, to preserve and protect the land that we had in our community. Um, and it's, it's simple because they had a lot of friends and family that acquired land on Sapo. The former commissioner told me that he has 11 friends and family that bought land on Sapo. So he never put money into that fund because they know they'll get their hands on that land. So this land is it's still very questionable. 
Uh, we can talk a little more about it later, but earlier this year, we had to go to the Capitol and fight about the Harris Authority laying on Southlow. And we thought we won that battle, but we did not win that battle. So this will come up again about this land in the community. And who has their eyes on that land now? Not descendants. The non-descendants have their eye on that land. The land is supposed to be for the descendants of Southlow, but throughout the years, things were reworded so much that now we got non-descendants after this land in the, in the community. So right now, we're the majority owner of property in the community, um, but that could change very quickly within a year. This is a recent auto go, but an old picture um, of the schools, of the kids going to school off, off the island. Um, we don't have a lot of kids left on Sablo. We have six kids on Sablo. From two-year-old, three-year-old to 17-year-old. So there's not a lot of kids available on Sapple, but there's a lot of articles out there about, about Sapple. We've been in news all over recently. So you can find us on CNN and every network over the last couple of weeks. So there's a lot of stuff out there, what's going on on Sapple. So I encourage y'all to, to Google Sapple, uh, Google me. Yes. Google anybody you know from Sapple. And you find a lot about what's going on on Sapo because I could be here all day tell you what what's going on on Sapo right now. Um, and like I mentioned, we do need support of the public with what's going on right now on Sapo. This is part of this bill two seventy three that I was speaking about earlier. So they snuck this in on us, um, and I heard about it because it was somebody on the Capitol floor that Saplo came up on a different bill. And they called me and we went into action. Um, if there was not somebody on the floor of the Capitol during that time, then we wouldn't know that they brought up the Harris Authority, it was making changes to the Harris Authority Act that would not benefit us because we was never informed of this act, uh, this bill 273. Because our state representative told people that he did talk to the people community but he did not talk to the people of the community. He did talk to the white owners of the community, but he did not talk to the black people of the community. So we found out about it. We thought we won that, but on the last hour, they turned it down. But this will come up again because the new landowners want the land on Sapelo. They want, do not want us on Sapelo. Um, they currently send around their own petition claiming to own 50% of, of the island in the community, the land in the community. And we got to fight that battle because uh, they do not own 50% of it. But we working on it. We gonna fight. Um, we got a lot of descendants, but not a lot of people available for the fight on the island. And we gonna win. You know? We've been winning all these years. Now we get to the farming. The farming is, is very important. We brought back a lot of our heritage crops. We brought the red peas that was brought over by people that was enslaved. We started doing sugar cane. We started going doing indigo on the island. We're getting some more herbs. Uh, we're trying to bring agriculture back to South. We're trying to do our heritage crops. Uh, we're trying to start our industry on Sapple and make it our own. But without land, we don't have none of that. We won't have none of that. Um, over the last couple of years, two of our fuel got flooded with salt water. Uh, so we can no longer use that. We can probably go back to it, but it's just going to happen again. Uh, the land that we need to do so to widen our agriculture program, we're being denied that land. So once again, this goes back to the state of Georgia denying us the land that we can plant more crops. We can help our community uh, in our culture, but we're not being helped. We're not getting the land that we need to make this agriculture problem work for us. So it's every day is something 
that we got to deal with to try to make this work. Nick Hyman been working with us for a long time with that and a lot of volunteers, some of them in this room. Uh, it's been a long process and we're still working at it and we will continue to do our agriculture program on South Road. But we definitely need more land on South Road to be able to continue to do what we're doing on South Road. Uh, that's a picture of Kanika Walker Bailey. Um, she always been very outspoken. Didn't take shit for anybody, and she started the first organization on Sapo in nineteen seventy six. Hall Hermit Community Foundation. Oh, she helped start that. She also helped start Psychol's organization in nineteen ninety three. So she was working for the state of Georgia. And she saw a map on the wall that said the Georgia on Sapple says Hall Hermit community to be acquired later with a red circle around her. So that was our last community. And she saw that and she brought it back to the community and people started rallying together. We started our first organization um, during that time, 1976. 1969, the state of Georgia purchased Sapple in 1976 in two parts. So when they purchased the South End of Sapple, that's where our last community was located on the South End of Sapple. So they want to remove us from that last community also totally all the way off the island. Uh, so with the help of Kanea Bailey, she halted that. And ever since then, she's been fighting to preserve the culture and preserve the island, um, try to just the way it is. This is one of the crops that we plant, the Saplo Ray Peas Project. So we normally make Hop and John with that. I think I got some. That's it. But we ain't making no Hop and John. They got a little sweet little stuff out there for y'all, something like that. But this is our red peas. So we grow this and we've been growing this for years, passed down through generation, and we grow it, harvest it, pack it, ship it from Sapo. So this is one of our heritage crops that we plant on Sapo. So the, the Sapo Ray peas. It comes with a little recipe also in there. So y'all, people that don't eat meat, don't buy my peas. Because you got to put ham heart, neck bone, you got to put something in there. You know, don't put no salt and pepper and tell me we got some Sapo Ray peas. No, you, you, you're not going to do that to our peas. So this is a photo that uh, we first started playing our sugar cane, and you see Clemson University helped us reestablish the sugar cane on Saplo. And some of these people I remember, and some I do not remember. But that guy in the back with the ugly mug—that's my brother back there. Yeah, that's probably the happiest you ever will see him right there. Mm -hmm. Uh, once again, this is just more picture of our agriculture. So that's me, my brother, and my mother, Kanee Walker Bailey. Um, that's me and Nick over here. Me and Nick again, also over here, making the syrup. Um, so we're crushing the syrup, the chicken over here. So we still grow, harvest, and press, and cook the chicken juice. Everything's done by hand. There's no additive to the syrup that we produce uh, from South Lowe. So it's a lot of work to, to do this process. And it, it takes us days sometimes to, to do this process. We got a sugar cane harvest, uh, November the what, Nick? 17th, November 17th. But we got a lot of help coming. So I, that's our goal this year uh, to cut sugar cane and replant sugar cane this year on Saplo. So we're trying to expand our sugar cane crops on Saplo. If, if some of y'all never taste natural syrup, Oh, y'all missing it. So next time you go to the store, read a bottle of syrup, you see what the first 10 ingredients is, it says nothing about sugar cane syrup. It might say on the bottle, but it's not. So, so this is one of the things that we continue to do and grow and try to make a name for us on Sapple. Uh, I got some of that too. Yeah. <laughs> You can put this all meat. Yeah. We also trying to 
bring back the sugar king grinding on South Hill because that was a big thing in our community. Everybody in the community grows sugar cane and carried the one guy house, and everybody sit around and grind the sugar cane. People made biscuits and cornbread, and it was a great celebration. So that is also one of our goals to continue to raise money so we can have a sugar cane grinding event on South Hill to invite the public and have a community event again on South Hill surrounding the sugar cane. Uh, Nick spoke earlier about the CWBP program, uh, University of Georgia. So this is another way of, of donating to the agriculture program. Um, it's through the UGA program also. So yeah, I'm glad you're taking the picture. Yeah. <laughs> so we always need support with this program. Um, you know, they asked me, what can we do to honor your mother? The first thing I think Muriel said was, well, we can do a plaque. We don't want to be known as a plaque. We don't want a, just a plaque that's going to sit there, uh, maybe forgotten about. It's going to get all moldy. and It's just not, it's not saying enough. And y'all seen the historical markers around. The wording is so small, they're used in some location that you can't stop and read it anywhere. You just see a marker and you just go right on past it. So I didn't think that was the right thing to honor my mother. So we came up with something different, something that's going to be life lasting, that's moving, that's working, and not just a marker on the side of the road. I didn't talk at all about my organization solo. So this is solo is Save Our Legacy Ourselves. Now, some of y'all academic people are going to say ourselves. And I spelled that way on purpose. I know what I was doing. So save our legacy ourselves. Um, we can't do it by ourselves. So that's what basically it means. So we need to support the people to help save our legacy. But if we don't put forth the effort to save our legacy, nobody else will. So save our legacy ourselves is us coming forward. We got to put forth the effort and then hopefully people come in and help us. So that's why I started Save Our Legacy Ourself. We got to be the one that steps out and push things and, and cherish our, our heritage and be proud of it. And then other people will be proud of it also. That's the next generation. Yeah. So I said we don't have many kids on, on the island, but we are trying to hold on and hope that people come back to the island. This is just another, what's that? Those are the monitors. Yeah, Heather is, no, no. Hannah is in the audience over there. Hannah worked on some of this also. Uh, this is water monitors and some of our food plot areas. Uh, just monitors in the ditches around Sapo to monitor the increase in salt water that's coming into our community. The salt water is starting to go further and further into our community. So with Dean Hardy and say Hannah did some work on that also. Uh, the salt water is starting to go further and further into our community. Uh, and we do not have an immediate answer for that. We are working with the core engineers to try to come up with something uh, to stop the flooding in our community. Uh, they didn't want to touch it for a long time because we wasn't large enough, we wasn't important enough. But right now, they just say I have a special funding that can possibly help us uh, keep some of this water out of our community. So if we don't stop this water from coming to our community, then probably in the next 15 years, a lot of property will have standing water of salt water on their property. So the same ditches that was in this community during the plantation time to take water out is now bringing water into our community. And this is an example of the possible flooding. Uh, and I think this is estimated around 2050. Um, just where our community may look like. Yeah. And 
and just just a, another article. Uh, it's a great article talking about not just Saplo, but the Gullah Geechee corridor, St. Helena, different places that African American community still are, and African American community still trying to struggle to hold on to their community uh, in their culture. So Saplo is not the only place, but to us, it's the only place we need to focus on right now because we are more in danger of any community along the Gullah Geechee corridor. But I do try to work with other communities in other states because we suffering with the same problems. Uh, we still got people coming in and making ways to remove us from our community. So I put it the nice way. Uh, some of you guys are in this room also. I won't point them out because one of them talked too much, so I ain't gonna even look at him. Yeah, but Share the Show is a program that we started with Solo, um, Nature Conservancy, so also to help with the flooding in our community. So Share the Show been gathering shells from all over the place to take the saplo to try to, well, we all going to do some living shoreline work around saplo. So living shoreline work was done around saplo, but it was done by the state of Georgia and federal government on their property. Nobody was paying attention to the Hallhammer community and the flooding of Hallhammer community. Shell and Show recognized that that's a problem. So they teamed with Solo and we're partnering up and we got enough shells uh, and we're going to do our own living shoreline work around the Hallhammer community. And hopefully that we can get the Corps to step in and support us with this. But we're taking this into our own hands to help preserve this community. This is just one of the herbal gardens that we planted last year. Some great peas. A pretty picture of our sugar cane, the purple ribbon sugar cane. Oh, that's me. I don't want to see that one. <laughs> uh, we talked a lot about our our land issues on, on Sapple. So recently, um, our county commissioners voted against us. The square footage of our house it was 1,400 square feet at one time, the largest. So the non-descendants um, came up with their own rezoning. And so now, as of a week ago, the square footage of our house is now is 3,000 square feet. So it more than doubled. Um, and this is all a political move. Uh, and I know this because I'm involved with a lot of these guys and hear a lot of these discussions. So one of our commissioners uh, is running for state representative next year. So the guys that he helped with the zoning also helped with his campaign. So we're fighting this right now. We got petition out right now. Uh, we, we got people knocking on doors right now. We need 2,000 signatures from our county. Um, if y'all could do it, that'd be great. But 2,000 signatures from our county to reverse this and right now we have probably 12 days to get those signatures before we have to go into the next stage of fight. So it's, it's a lot of pressure right now to get those 2,000 signatures um, to get this zoning replaced. And it's not just the square footage of the house. Uh, it's the elevation of the house. Uh, they didn't want to have an agriculture program, but they did remove that. Uh, they did a lot of things. So everything that's in that new zoning does not support the community, does not support the African American community. They support the newcomers that's coming to the island and that's on the island now. So everything they got in that new zoning erases everything about our community. So it's very important to us to get this changed quickly as possible. Um, if if not, then we're in trouble with our, our community. Um, they saying that there's no more culture. So we got the white land on us saying there's no more culture. Um, they said, well, they named people, an example, Alan Green, you know, Earl Walsh. So they're naming the older people out of that passed away. And, and just something that happens in a lot of black communities, the people wait for the elders to pass away and then they'll make their move on, on the community. 
So in the commission meeting, they mentioned that there's no more elders in the, in the community, really. There's no more culture in the community. There's nobody left to fight in the community. This is a statement from one of the our county commissioners. Uh, and just because we now saw the role making sweet grass baskets or cast nets, uh, performing for them with the ring shout, uh, they don't see the culture. But we are the culture. We still have culture. We still there. This, this, we, we are that the island. My head. I am Sapo. That's our home. So to them, it's an investment of you know, how much I get my value, my property up. What size house I can build? How can I displace these people on South Florida? So that's the investment. Our investment is this is our home. This is where we build. Uh, this is where we want to be. And we get it sometimes. Why y'all stay someplace that y'all people's enslaved? We work with our people's enslaved and they purchased land there. They work hard. Uh, and it was, they had a lot of pride. So, why get rid of something that your people work so hard for? You know, selling your land is like selling your ancestors all over again. So we try to hold on the, <clears throat> the best way we can, but we under a lot of pressure from, and this is, and sometimes I just, I say new people, newcomers, but it just, the older class entitlement or older white gentlemen in the deep south. That's just what it boils down to it. It's a form of racism. It's a form of entitlement. And whether you want to believe it or not, it's politically based, whether you're a Republican or not, in that area of Georgia. So this is a sign going to South Lowe tell you about South Before You Board the Ferry. I don't know if all y'all knew, but you had to get on a ferry to get to South. And that is one of the things that people love is this isolation. I can tell people not to come to South. Lowe. So that's the selling point. We got beautiful beaches. So people are drawn to the island because of that. But we don't want to be reduced to a historical marker. We already got a historical marker prior to getting on a ferry. We don't want to have one in our community. We ride to our community and we point that stuff that was. You know, we still want to ride to our community and say, this is. And the way they want it is they want to ride to the community and say, this was. Um, so, you know, throughout our history, people always curious about our culture and who we are, always trying to figure us out. And, you know, we can care less about figuring y'all out, but you're always trying to figure us out. Um, Y'all love our food, y'all love our culture, but we still second class citizens. Um, you know, we are for enslaved to Jim Crow to other names, uh, but we still recognize, as I see it, as second class citizens. We still do not have those rights. And so we have a change of the guards of the older gentlemen in our legal system and keep them from training to the next generation to do the same thing, it's always going to be a fight. Now, this is the petition. Well, this is the flyer. The flyer that 100 Miles Organization uh, that's located in, in Brunswick, Georgia, along with Hall Hunter Foundation, uh, solo organization and Sycar's organization, uh, we all joined together to fight for this cause. So this just came out today uh, and we will be circulating this online all over the place uh, to gain support for this cause to fight to, to get this zoning reversed. We have the uh, Georgia Southern Private Law Center on our side also, spoke with them today. So they will be representing us also to try to get this reversed uh, as, as soon as possible. So a lot of people are aware that this is the wrong thing, uh, but we got our local politician that would not give in. Uh, so we're seeking outside support and help to do so because 
we not recognize not just because of our size of the community, but we recognize our American people in our county because we are a small number of people. And once again, believe it or not, I live this life. This is based on Democrats, Republican. They did not respect us in that county, Macarthur County, rather on South or off South, because they know they don't need our votes. So they don't. They know they don't have to care to us because our vote is not important to them. So they're not going to to yield to us unless we fight. And people don't like when we fight. Uh, I hope that some of y'all can understand that instead of you know people always say you know black people always angry, black people want to fight. We don't want to fight. We're always being pushed to fight. And we don't defend ourselves. If we defend ourselves, then we're angry. Then we shouldn't be fighting. Then we ought to order. But we always put in a position that we got to fight. And the fight continues. This is some contact information. Uh, my website, address, phone number, um, anywhere that y'all want to support, reach out. Come to Saplo, however, whatever y'all want to do, this is my information. Um, so call me, email me, text me. Uh, you better text me because I, I don't do email too well. I got it. Yeah. So text me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So thank y'all. And any questions? Mm -hmm. Wow, you have no more questions? I know you had one. Go ahead and go on her first, you know, because she's she been anxious over there. Hi. Um, I grew up in that area, and I'm curious to know if the Sapelo Island Foundation is doing anything to help with this um, situation? They are. I, I got a message for one of their board members today. I haven't read it yet, uh, but I, I think they, they will. I've been working with them in the past, uh, and I, I think we will get some support from them. Yes. Excellent. Yes. Thank you. Uh, what was the thing you said on November 17th with like the sugar cane, is that like a thing that students can sign up for? Uh, yeah, but we got more students we can handle right now. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, that's when we actually harvest the sugar cane, okay. which is rare. Sometimes we don't have enough people, but you know, we got more people than we can handle because of the housing on Sapple. It's not a lot of housing available on Sapple, so we just maxed out the day with the housing for bringing people over. I got you. Thank you. Uh-huh. Hi, thank you so much for being here and letting us know uh, what's going on. I was just wondering, you said that a lot of people, a lot of descendants have left the island. Yes. To what extent are some of those former descendants involved in trying to save your land, your property, or is it just they left and they're not really engaged anymore? They have been engaged over the last couple of weeks over the Zooming issue. So every meeting, um, the co house was maxed out. People were standing in the halls around the walls. So people have re engaged. Mm -hmm. And I hope my people don't go back to sleep again. So, you know, sometimes we get comfortable and go to sleep. Uh, and we got people working on 10 year plan. We work on uh, next week's plan. Uh, so we got people attention. And I hope they stay vision. And I hope they stay involved because we're going to need the descendants to pull this off also. I want to know what can we do outside of getting in touch with our elected officials? What, what other things we can do? Well, get in touch with your know, state representative. It don't have to be the one in our area. Uh, you know, they work together with each other. Uh, contact them, express your concern. If this comes back up in the legislature next year, just be vigilant. You hear something about SAPL, see something about SAPL, say something about SAPL, uh, and also contact our county commissioners. Um, you're not going to get a response from them, but still, 
contact all county commissioners, send them an email, express your dislike about this. And if you need, do an open record request, and you'll see a lot of illegal action that was done uh, by our county, morally done by our county. Is there any vision or hope for bringing people back to live there, descendants who've gone in the future? Uh, it, it is. It's, it's not easy as you would think because um, job is, is still another issue uh, on the island. Now, the, the county did present our comprehension plan to us, uh, which they wrote based on how our county can maximize and, and make money off of Sapo, but none of those businesses included any descendants or residents of Sapo. So it's it's a little difficult to get people back when there's no jobs available or not. Does the University of Georgia have any um, relationship with the local county officials? Yeah. Can you elaborate? <laughs> yeah, we in the UJ facility on UJ campus, so you know, and, and UJ, this is my disclaimer right now. UJ do support uh, a lot of things on the island. Um, it's supported more on a local level, like on South Low, uh, with Nick Heinen, uh, the university itself. I don't think they even know what's going on. Uh, it, it's, just a, it's a lot of alumni also that's law to UGA, and UGA is law to them. I'll put it that way. It that's does, in politics. It does seem that that might be a wellspring of support if some kind of um, relationship could be established, uh, mm. since, given the university's presence on, presence on the island. They're not going to jeopardize their funding and their alumni uh, for us. Maybe they could surprise us. <laughs> <laughs> not very likely, but, you know. Well, you work on that. Reparations. <laughs> Tell me where to start. <laughs> I don't know. You came up with it. That's, <laughs> yeah. I'll support you. <laughs> Hello. Yes. Um, you mentioned the uh, issues with saltwater inundation um, and sea level rise. I was wondering if um, the non-descendants on the island, what are, I mean, they must also be concerned about the problem. So why is there so much investment um, and why is there so much development if, there's so much flooding and saltwater inundation. Because they build a house on stilts. A lot of our houses uh, is on ground level because it was built in the 1940s and 50s, you know. So we didn't have this flooding issue then. So our house is, you know, a few feet off the ground where the average house is eight feet off the ground. Okay. Um, so they're not concerned about that. And also, just, you know, throughout our Black history, uh, when you get enough white people in your community, the government will do something. So, you know, they're going to keep building because they know that eventually the core will come and they know eventually somebody's going to come in and help. So is that why you mentioned the Army Corps of Engineers? Are, are they only helping because there's so much new development in? No, they're, they're helping now based on us, the descendants okay. and the people. So right now, yeah, they're just focusing on us. All right. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, I was just going to ask, I know, um, I, I know we're at UGA, but I know the university itself won't do anything, mm -hmm. no offense, mm -hmm. but, um, I was wondering if y'all are worried about trying to get the, um, the living shoreline built, have y'all considered working within like a smaller department here at UGA, maybe working with the, like, uh, the 
land school. I don't know which one that is, but <laughs> there's a land school somewhere. Maybe working with them. <laughs> or I know um, we have a university garden here and they do a lot of uh, shell revision stuff. I'm sure you already know about that, though. Yeah. Um, yeah. But anything like that might would help. I think we need to stick with our current plan and don't muddy up the water and continue to work with Shell and Show and Nick Heinen in the direction we're going and hopefully the Corps Engineer and Nature Conservancy. Uh, I think we're safer that way right now. Uh, if they want to come in, we'll be glad to have other people come in and support this cause. And once again, if you feel like bringing that to them, I don't have that connection. I don't even know the name of the school. I was just asking. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Nick, I thought you would be walking the mic around. How are you going? <laughs> Just want to ask, um, what is the best financial way to help support you? Is it through Solo or are there other organizations to donate to? Solo is always first in my book. I'm yes. sorry, but how do I do that? Do that. Uh, oh, we, we, we're at? right there. We're right there. Yeah. Take a picture of that. Yes. And, and the Cornelia Bailey Walker program through UJ is on UJ's site. Um, they work directly with Solo. So that is another avenue to help support. And I do work with the other organization that was on there also, the Harlequin Foundation, SACARS. Uh, we do work together on a lot of issues. Has there been any direct contact from you or Solo to UGA, particularly to for assistance directly, or is it just through ch change of administration, et cetera? From direct Gary contact all through UGA to me? Has there been any direct contact from you or Solo to UGA directly, or has the communication been from administration all the way down? either from Jerry or whoever. Administration, it will be working through Nick Hines. Through Nick? Mm-hmm. Oh, so Nick's the one that we talked to. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yes. He's not hard to find. He's always around here. Yeah. And I think this will be the last question, and then we'll... Um, no, this won't be the last question. Let's you want some more? Okay. Keep going. We got some food, too. Well, Thank you for coming up here and talking with us. Um, will you help us to better understand why exactly the zoning, the changes of the zoning ordinance increasing the size of homes being built to 3,000 square feet is such a problem for the descendants? It is a problem because we are a historical community. We've been on the historical register since 1993, but they don't recognize that. We know as the last each community uh, in Georgia on the coast but they don't recognize that, even though it's worded everywhere in, in the state, in the nation, they don't recognize that. Uh, and the taxes will increase on us. It will not happen next year, but it will increase. So along with the historical status that we always want to preserve as you ride to our community, then we're going to have another tax increase like it did earlier in 2013 um, that caused a lot of people to sell. Uh, a lot of people couldn't afford to pay their taxes. So this is what's going to happen with this, these new structures. And also you will have more entitled people coming in uh, because it, it will build bigger houses and making more changes that way. Uh, so it, it will affect the community right now and in the future. So in a few years, um, we won't have that, that view of our community. We won't have those structures that call a historical community. Did I ask your question, Ms. Sarah? Okay. Uh, I was hoping, could you speak a little bit to specifically like solidarity with other uh, black help, black self-help organizations? And I'm particularly thinking of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives um, as like another example of folks who are doing for themselves to try to like combat against these kinds of forces. Yeah, uh, unfortunately it's, it's very difficult to work with a group constantly because they got their own battle going on, we got our own battle going on, we support each other, we show up to things. But to be consistent uh, is very difficult because we can't move away from our own problems long enough to, to be there with someone else all the time. So I, I do work um, I mean, with, with Sick Hunter, uh, McIntosh Seed, uh, and other organizations, but we 
we work and communicate. But I know you're thinking, why can't all y'all come together and solve this problem together? It's, it's very difficult from state to state to county to county to do so because the type of work that I do and others do is very few. It's not many people willing to sacrifice to do this type of work. And when you do this type of work, you're going to lose family, friends, finance. You will lose a lot to do this type of work because you will create enemy. If you don't create enemy doing this type of work, you're not doing your job. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Do we have any more? One more? Okay. All right. Um, in order, so I to to create jobs on Sapelo and bring um, back some of the descendants, mm -hmm. like agriculture, that's what you're involved with. Yeah. So do you have other descendants that are interested in farming and, and continuing to boot, uh, grow these heritage crops and bring back that culture? Um, well, we got other people interested in doing other, other things, you know, they, uh, they won't be out there with me getting hot and sweaty and, and dirty. So what are the other things that create, <laughs> you know, jobs that people could do? People into tours and you know, tourism on the island. So there's some bed and breakfast on the island. Unfortunately, most of them are owned by another descendant. So we're getting more people to hopefully open up more of those those lodging. Um, there's always room for a restaurant, uh, other type of businesses on, on the island, even simple as a mechanic shop. Uh, additional ferry service or someone with private ferry service. So there's things available because we have a lot of tourists come to Sapelo every year. So I want to be one. <laughs> you know, I would love to get back. Okay, well, you come with it and you love it. Make sure you leave it because we got people that come in and love it. They say, <laughs> "You, Maurice, I will come back to Athens." Yeah, we well, want you to pull it. into it's that 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 groove with everybody else. No, I will leave it. It's a special place. I went there as a UGA student, you know, several times in my senior year. Okay. So no, I, okay. but I'll leave it, I promise. Okay, thank you. <laughs> One last question. Okay. Are you working with the Odom's School of Ecology or just the UGA Marine Institute? Or are they combined at this point? I don't know if they could find now. I worked through UJ with Nick. Uh, he works a lot of channels. Uh, sometimes he don't tell me how he worked those channels, and sometimes I don't want to know. <laughs> you know, as long as we get stuff done. So he's on this end. I'm on the south low end. Yeah. Well, Nick, are, is the UGA uh, Odom School of Ecology working with Sapelo? Okay. That's right. Because I understand Eugene Odom established the Marine Institute there because it has some of the most pristine estuaries. <laughs> yeah. 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 We we just don't gravitate a lot to Eugene Odom and him coming to South Low, uh, it, it was another side to that. So, you know, during that time, then people start losing land in a place like Shell Home, like, you know, because you had a research started and Reynolds needed more land for the researchers and build houses and stuff like that. So we lost another community in that, in that process. Uh, and there was never a relationship with UJ in the, in the community. Nick spoke about that earlier. Yeah, rebuilding a relationship, building a relationship with the community. So we live on the same island and we never knew what UJ was doing. We could not go to that end of the island. We was not allowed to go to that end of the island. We could not go to the beach on that end of the island. So there wasn't this lovely relationship going on on South Low, uh with UJ Reynolds and Eugene Odom. Uh, the this, this science part of things has not really been our concern uh, in the past. It is now because we've been invited into the circle now, but we need her access to none of these things. We was not allowed. That's very interesting. 
Thank you. <laughs> yes. All right, yeah. let's give a round of applause.